And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a returning good brother to the temple. Previously here, previously here for the likes of Big Eyes Small Mouth and Anime 5e, as well as well as the what I nicknamed the Tristat Trinity because go, because going with the full name was too many syllables. And now coming back now coming back to the fray with the reincarnation of Silver Age Sentinels known as Absolute Power. The one and only, the band best known as Discami. How are you doing today, man? Hey, thanks very much. I'm doing great. Thanks, Melja. I appreciate uh, you having me back on. Yeah, thank thank you for thank you for coming on. Um, uh, I will get into the thing the thing with the name change in a bit, but I need to so I need to adhere to my traditions before I do that. Now. Since absolute power, since absolute power is a superhero game, um, I'd like to ask two questions to start out, and they're kind of in the same theme. The first is your first introduction to su to supers, whether it be through comic books or something else, and second, um, your first introduction to supers in a role playing sense. Ah, well, certainly. Uh... I was one of those kids, those weird kids that the comics that I had growing up weren't the superhero type. Uh, I grew up on the the Richie Rich, Scrooge McDuck type comics. Mm -hmm. uh, that's what I had. I was from a small town and we didn't really have a lot of superhero type comics going around. Uh, so my main introduction to superheroes was from TV, uh, like the, the old uh, Super Friends TV show, Wonder Trump Powers Activate, mm -hmm. the old Spider-Man, of course, uh, fell in love with that. So I was a big fan of the cinematic version of the superheroes. Uh, the comics came significantly later. later. Uh, well, while I, of course, read a few comics, it was really uh, my friend Jesse, who was you know someone I met in university, and we got into role playing. And and I was consider myself fairly lucky with comics that he was an avid comic reader and knew all the good stuff and all the bad stuff. And he had said ninety percent of it's crap, but the ten percent of it, I'm going to get you the 10% to read. And so I always only fed the good stuff. I'm sure that there's lots of bad comics out there, but I generally haven't read them. It's all been good stuff that I've read. Uh, and, you know, Kingdom Come probably being my favorite. That and The Authority. I uh, love The Authority as well. So that was my exposure to comics. I, I really didn't get into the comics until my university years because I was you know, from a small town and and Richie Rich was my kind of comics, that and Archie and, and that type of stuff. Oh. Uh, so, yeah, so that's with that. And then you'd ask about role playing for superheroes. Mm -hmm. Once again, uh, you know, I grew up, my role playing, you know, hitting it in middle school was Dungeons and Dragons, of course. And, and that was the big thing. We didn't do a lot of role playing, but Dungeons and Dragons ruled the, the, the roost at that point. And then getting into university is when I started having a little bit more exposure to different role-playing games and Village of Vigilantes was actually my first superhero game that I played. Yeah, and debatably and uh, and this is one of those things that could be argued until the cows come home. Villains and Vigilantes is considered by some to be the first soup the first um superhero game proper. Um no, Grant, no, Grant. Yeah, it was it was really good. Uh, I mean, I know it wasn't it wasn't licensed, and that was one of the things that I liked about it was that it it wasn't tied to a particular universe. It was kind of very open, and you, know, you can kind of play yourself if you wanted to. I thought, yeah, we had lots of fun with it. The f the funny thing about about the about the early run when it came to superhero license is the first um the first Marvel superheroes game. Um, Marvel Phase Rip, as it's known. Yeah, the Phase Rip did not in its in its earliest form did not have character creation because I guess they I guess TSR didn't learn their lesson from their Indiana Jones RPG. <laughs> well, there's also I mean I've done a lot of licensing work and a lot of it is also license restrictions on what you can and can't do. Now I don't know the specifics of that one, but sometimes when you do a license, they don't want you. The, the, the license holder doesn't want you offering options of playing anyone other than the licensed characters. So that might have been a factor back then. I, I don't know. Or it could have just been a mistake that they figured if you're going to play a superhero game, everyone wants to play the Marvel characters. No one wants to actually create your own. Given th given that Iron Crown was able to get the Lord the um, Middle-Earth license, 
because nobody had else had, nobody else had asked beforehand. I personally chalk it up to it be to this to role playing be this newfangled thing that a lot of a lot of the publishers didn't quite get because that wasn't a problem with DC Heroes, which came out a few years later. That's true. That's true. I mean, different companies, but uh, yeah, I mean, it's certainly possible that they just figured, let's create a game and let's have people play the the, the Marvel characters, mm -hmm. which, you know, given how, how often Phase Rip still comes up in conversations, I mean, it's a, it's a fan favorite for so many people, even though it is decades old. Mm -hmm. And there... There are pl with both with both the with both Marvel Phase Rip and D and DC Heroes especially. There's pl there's plenty of retro clones. Um, I'm wor I'm working on a review of Ascendant, which is a fusion between those two games. Um, and there's a there's also the fact that there is a verti veritable treasure trove of material on both write ups and um, classic Marvel Forever for both of them. And yeah, that's certainly advanced. The, the legacy aspect, uh, you know, the longer games out, if it had a lot of fans that posted something, then there's so much information you can uh, glean from the internet. Yeah, and as Picasso alleg allegedly has 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 been attributed to saying, um, "Great artists steal." <laughs> that's true enough. So do thieves, though. Yeah, although although, con although consi considering <laughs> considering some of the um some of the arguments of the some of the chicken or egg arguments that I've seen designers get into versus programmers. No, oh, yeah. <laughs> you steal code from a programmer, all he says is it's not my code. Ah, it's a little bit more difficult to get away with it in a gaming sense. Yeah. I mean that that's that certainly hadn't stopped Wizards of the Coast from tr from trying to own the term tapping, but um, but that's a whole other story. <laughs> <laughs> now, it's in. It's interesting that you that you bring that you used um villains and vigilantes that, as that, um, largely because that's not that's not one I hear often. Usually, when it comes to people's first introduction to supers RPGs. There are three names that all that always end up coming up ninety nine percent of the time: um, Marvel Phase Rip, DC Heroes later Blood of Heroes because because licensing shenanigans, and Champions. Which all all three all three still good all, although um I do I do remember at I do remember at a young age making a joke about how about how a rules light superhero RPG is an oxymoron. <laughs> well, gamers love their their fixed numbers, which is of course really funny when it comes to superheroes mm -hmm. in particular because uh what a particular character like Superman, what he does in one comic is completely unrelated to what he can do in another comic. And trying to peg a particular character to say this character can lift x number of tons mm -hmm. is is a futile effort given that you have no clue which version that character is coming from. And so gamers want these hard numbers assigned to the characters and yet uh you know there's an advantage with the rules light system of course where you don't have those numbers assigned but as soon as you start doing more hand wavy and say kind of go with the flow go with what feels right for the narration the next question is well give me a number uh and you know it's that eternal conflict between wanting to have the role playing narratively smooth versus giving numbers that people can latch on to yeah the other the other um the other reason why I make that joke ab about it is due to the is due to the sheer amount of subtypes and and <coughs> sorry genres that superhero that superheroes have dipped into over the last 70 years. That's true. There's been a lot, an awful lot. And now when someone says a superhero role-playing game, you really kind of got to say well, what type of superhero? <laughs> what type of genre? Like, it's no longer superheroes aren't really a genre any more than you know anime is a genre. The, you know, superheroes is such a, a wide scale. You get the you know from from godlike, you know, something very very dark and and you know a long time ago, decades ago, versus you know total modern stuff now. That's that's more. Well, some of it can be very kid-like, some of it can be very cutting edge and dark, and some of it can be very comic-y, slap booky. So yeah, there's there's quite a range with that too. Yeah. And then of course you have the Silver Age, which is drugs. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, old Speedy kind of set the stage for that one. Uh 
No, I'm I'm not going with that. I'm just go I'm just going with the with the whiskey tangle foxtrot stuff that was in the Silver Age. Oh, I you're see that. The speedy and yeah, drugs yeah. thing, you're thinking of the Bronze Age. Yeah, just just as it as it's kind of that was one of the ones that kind of marks the shift over uh that particular comic. And yeah, it's interesting. I missed the you know, given when I when I grew up and where I grew up, I missed all that interesting Silver Age stuff and I got introduced to some of it later. Yeah, but it's I ref with a lot of the with a lot of the stories that were coming around around that time, yes, yeah, some of it was a reaction to Wortham's god awful book, but some but some of it, um, I refuse to believe that so, that some of those stories were written by sober people. <laughs> I <know> well, it, <laughs> I mean, in the sixties, you know. <laughs> yeah, plus sixties and seventies were a golden age for people to find creative ways to bend the rules. Um. Whether whether it be in, whether it be in game design, whether it be in sports or any, or anything else, but that that brings me to the to um the predecessor of Absolute Power, that being Silver Age Sentinels. So when I had you on to talk about to talk about Big Eyes Small Mouth, we kind of went into the origin story of that. So I. Do, I do think it would be fair to um, go into the chain of events that led to the original Silver Age Sentinels, and um, what and whether it was just wanting to do tristat with su with superheroes, or if there was a different reason it came to be. Yeah, well, certainly back you know then when Big Eyes Small Mouse was second edition, that was kind of our thing, and we're doing a lot of the anime games and. You know, in the company that that friend that I mentioned, Jesse, who was uh, my friend at the time, and we, you know, he was working with the company. He was big in the comics. Jeff McIntosh, our uh, graphic designer, was big in the in the comics. Mm -hmm. uh, Lush, Lucian Shelvin, he was there as well. And all these people knew comics really well, and I kind of didn't that well, uh, that much. But we were constantly hearing from so many fans online and at conventions about people using uh, Bassem Second Edition. They were using it for superhero games. It's like, oh, you know, I you know, I know it's an anime game, but I'm using it for a superhero game or running a Marvel game or a DC game or whatever. And because it was the substitute for for kind of champions back then, like champions third, fourth edition was a much more complex rule set than than big Bessem second edition, right? Uh, and and it, and it was kind of the king of, of a lot of the superhero role playing back then. But people really liked the the, the fact that Bessem offered a lot of the same elements, point based, balanced, uh, flexible creation system, comprehensive, but didn't have the baggage of a more crunchy system. And so we had kept hearing again and again, people are using it for superheroes. And uh, I don't know, I can't remember who was brought up, it could have been me uh, from the business point of view, it could have been Jesse from a, you know, comic point of view, I said, Hey, why don't why don't we actually do a superhero game and republish that? And at that point, there was only really one version of Tristat. Now, it had been modified uh, in Bessem Second Edition when we did an expansion for Tenchi Muyo, uh, a core book, or we did El Hazard or something. So there was little modifications to it, but it, but the core elements of Tristat was the same. But we knew if we were going to do a superhero game, Tristat, um, Bessem Second Edition, wasn't set up to handle Superman. I mean, it just didn't... It could do it, but we didn't. It wasn't in the the book itself. Bassem Second Edition and Superman, they just weren't on the same scale, mm -hmm. and so we would have had to change the system slightly. And that's when we transitioned because Bassem was just a two D six system, mm -hmm. and we looked and we said, well, we had a roll under system. Which in hindsight, I don't know exactly you know why I came up with roll under, but I think it's the idea of high numbers, so you have a high stat. Yeah. And you're rolling dice, and the, the higher the stat, the better chance you have of succeeding. You had to roll under. You couldn't have a roll over. Mm -hmm. I wasn't even thinking target numbers. I was just thinking doing your stat, and the only way to do that was to roll under. And so if we're going to be ratcheting up everyone's abilities to higher numbers because they're more competent, more capable, then we had to have a bigger die type. Otherwise, they're going to succeed at everything constantly. They had no chance of failing, which is why the D10 came in. And again, we didn't think at that point of revising TriStat into the roll high system. That came later, after SAS came out. Mm -hmm. But when we did Silver Age Sentinels, like, okay, well, let's switch to D10 and scale things up past the, the 12 for our stats and past the level 6 for our, our attributes and bring things up and then bring the die type up. And that changes, you know, keeps the curve element of a 2d10 system but it obviously changes the the scope the the range of it 
And so all of those things came together to make a game. But we knew, unlike Bessem, and this was always one of the things that I, I, I liked most about Bessem, but I also regretted it, is that because we tried to be the everything anime game, there was nothing it could be because it was everything, which means it had no setting. When we were doing Silver Age Sentinels, we we needed a setting. Um, you know, if you look at at Marvel, you could say, well, is, "Is Marvel a setting?" It's like, well, kind of. It's a universe. It's not really a setting, but it it has setting elements. Same with DC. I mean, you could say the setting is Earth, but it's a very particular type of Earth. And so, when we were doing Silver Age Sentinels from Bessem, we knew if we we're going to do it, we had to change the system to handle the higher power scale, but then we had to integrate and create a whole world because what interests people, I think, about superhero role-playing is not, it's not really a system. They like the fact that they can create everything, but they want a, a, a rich campaign world. Mm -hmm. Now, gamers being creative, big gamers being gamers, most people want to create their own thing. We, we get that. But even if you have a, a created world that they're not using exactly all of the elements that you populate that world with they can use as inspiration as examples of what could be done so if you're say picking up a marvel game you know, from you know, back in the 80s or the 90s and you didn't want to run marvel but you can look and say well i know the captain america type or in DC, I know what the Batman type is. I can look at the characters and how they're done and how they're integrated within the setting. And then I can use that as an inspiration, not as a not as a ripoff or even a homage, but just as a context for how the system works. How do you handle Batman's gadget belt? How do you handle the Flash's speed? And so using this, the when we created Silver Age Sentinels, we knew we had to have a world, not that people could only play in that world, but because that was the context from which we could explain how the system worked. And that was always something we missed in Bessem until 4th edition, of course, and now we've, we're doing more of that. But it's still not the same thing as a, at, at Silver Age Sentinels, which yeah. that world is what really drew me to it. And as I said, I'm not, I wasn't a big comic person and I still don't read tons of comics. That's never been my thing. Uh, I'm much more into anime than I am comics. But what drew me into Silver Age Sentinels was, was the characters and the stories and the narration of that. That's what made that game powerful. And this is an interesting time to do to, it's, it's, funny, you br it's funny you bring up you being more interested in anime, given that over the over the last um, decade or so, we've seen the line kind of blurring, especially with the popularity of stuff like My Hero Academia. Yeah, precisely. Um, which, which um, Tiger and Bunny had to cr had to crawl so that Hiro so that Hiroaka could wa could walk. And of and of course, there's been th it's it's not like that's nothing new because. If there was one person who was really put, who was really pushing back in the day to try and work to try and work with um, Japan in some in some form, it was Stan Lee. Um, whether that is that's it was through that that we kind of ended up getting that weird um, Spider Man pro project back in the seventies. <laughs> Which, yeah, and then, well, and then the, Mar the Marvel MangaVerse came out of that, yeah, right? When when it was which, getting popular. Which truth be t truth be told, if I'm being honest. Um, I found the Marvel manga ver the the Marvel manga verse in comic form I found interesting. The collaboration with Madhouse I found to be a disappointment. Um, yeah, I mean it's not not for everyone. I mean I prefer more. I mean I don't want to say pure anime because that that sounds a little pretentious. But uh, yeah, I mean I know why they did it. Of course, Th there's reasons to do that type of stuff. They don't need to do that now, but I know why they did it when they did. Well, for me per for me personally, the pro the problem that the problem that I had, and this is the reason why I brought up the Marvel manga verse, that was a bit more on point with what with um what one would expect. Because I remember seeing the two teasers that they put up at at um Comic Con, the year that I went, and one of them was for Wolverine, one of them was for Iron Man. The Wolverine one visually had a lot of had a lot of leanings of um Kawajiri's work. Especially, especially stuff like Ninja Scroll and yeah, to it really movies. felt like a Ninja Scroll. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that. And going with and going with, so, it seemed like they were going to be adapting the Japan saga of the Wolverine comic, which is a natural thing to do. Um, the other one was Iron Man, which had a lot of the Itano style ca um, camera techniques that he would use so much in Macross, especially when mm -hmm. missiles are involved. 
and I was thinking, oh, okay, we're we're applying we're applying at we're applying um, cin- quote unquote cinematography techniques into co- into um, comic book characters, and what we ended up getting out of it was something that was largely played straight. That w- that was my issue, and that's why I say that it was a disappointment, especially from mm. st- from a venerated studio like Madhouse. Right. Yeah. Who in the last few years has had is- has had issues with finishing things? Hello, one one punch man, looking at you. But it, it but it is st- it but the um but I'd say they were the first first ones to really get um did you paint proper. If you look at a lot of those early two thousands ones, the reason why why some of them are so ugly looking is because the tr- industry was transitioning to digi paint, and not everybody was able to make the was able to make the shift as easily. Yeah, it, no, it, certainly when they moved away from the cells into more digital stuff, that yeah, there there was definitely a transitionary period there. In the engineering world, they call this kind of thing teething troubles. Mm. But with it. Now we've t- now we've talked about we've talked about the shift between roll high and roll low, but but um, I'd say one of the other things I I f- I feel is important to bring up is what you mentioned about having s- um archetypes and the like to b- to build off of because I think that ha- I think that is a good response to an issue that I've seen a lot with universalist games. It's what I like to call the swim damn it problem. Where you have you have this potential you have this potential to do just about any kind of character, but people need a foundation to build around. Otherwise, otherwise you're throwing them right into the deep end, and and you have, and the only swimming lesson you're giving them is stop drowning. Yeah, that's that's fair with with open ended systems. Mm-hmm. And of course, given all the subgenres when it comes to superheroes, well. <laughs> That's about as that's about as oh that's about as open as you can get. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, obviously, the even when we looked at the well, we had to increase the scale. Certainly, going into from Bessem into Silver Age Sentinels, we also had to increase the number of options at that point because there's powers that are more superhero-y that it didn't really come across in a lot of anime. Let's say plant control. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, if you, if you can't handle plant control in your game, then is it really did you have that comprehensive superhero game because there's you know not that many characters that have it but there's enough that it's it's part of the genre and so we had to add a bunch of extra powers into silver age sentinels and then we had to add in the different versions of of things because how teleport functions in you know with character a versus character b in a superhero comic is going to be different in terms of uh the distance the range the people that can bring with them and so that's why we ended up not only just expanding the scope, but also the level of customization mm-hmm. just went through the roof. And we ended up creating something that I think got closer to the complexity that Champions was. And it still wasn't Champions. It still wasn't Hero System. Uh, we had a, a fun little thing back uh, you know, with the Hero Games that we, when we were publishing Silver Age Sentinels, that we did these these ads where we'd be mocking each other's games and we'd be publishing these and and you know we were both on board with it but we'd be make fun of of how incredibly detailed and math heavy hero was and here would make fun of how hand wavy and non-specific ours was and it was a fun little thing that we did we just we just really enjoyed doing that type of crossover which eventually led to a to a crossover expansion which was kind of fun uh, as well but yeah the the problem with the superheroes is that it's it, it, there's so much comic. I guess it when it comes down to there's so much to draw from. Everyone expects your superhero game to handle every single aspect of comics, and that's very daunting for anything other than the most robust system. Unless you're going to do some hand waving, which yeah. you know I, I think hand waving it has its place. The and the only way to really minimize that is to is to build a, is to make it explicitly clear that you're building around a certain um, angle with superheroes. I'd say a good example of that is masks, which is building its which is building itself clearly around the um, young hero archetype. You know, young justice, Teen Titans, to a certain absolutely. Extent. That's what it's building around. It's a far easier task to create a focused superhero game than it is to try to create 
the next champions, Mutant Mastermind, Silver Age Sentinels, like the, the comprehensive universal one, much easier to focus in on. It. And there's been some really popular examples of, of stuff that they've done a portion of it really well. Yeah. And I could... You mentioned you mentioned God you mentioned Godlike earlier and its success and um its successor Wild Talents which I covered not too long ago, um that is a, that is aiming more for the um '90s era kind of thing. Yeah, I mean obviously it's you know there's the, the, some of the older ones and you know Godlike what what particular was attracted me to that as a as a concept was that they knew what they wanted to do and it was very focused and i think it there was seen to be elements of world of darkness kind of you know on the periphery of that but there was no they didn't pretend that godlike was a game that you would use for four color avengers versus justice league like that they didn't they didn't set it up for that they were very specific on what they were doing with that uh, and i think and you know the new ones like mask as you mentioned it they're, they're very specific as well and that's great if you want to be focused nothing wrong with that the route that i happen to chose both with bessem and with silver age sentinels and then moving into absolute power is going for the universal approach yeah. um and you know that's just the choice that that i made versus a different company now before i get before i get into the name change with absolute power there's one other thing i want to cover and that is since since we covered bessem's stint with the d with the d20 system back in the day and how, and how, and your and your um thoughts post mortem on that, I would like to I would like to get your what vibe you got from you got after the fact from the D twenty run with with Silver Age Sentinels. Yeah, it's you know it's interesting, of course, because I mean I grew up with D and D. That was my game. Uh, second edition A D and D specifically is when I really I just used that for years, mm -hmm. and whenever we had you know hey tristat's the best we have the best system it's great i love this game and then as i think i mentioned with bessem whenever uh, an industry friend had kind of said hey if you don't do uh, a, a bessem d20 game someone else is going to someone else is going to do d20 anime mm -hmm. and you're the anime company for rpgs why don't you do it and i was like oh yeah you're kind of right so once we made that decision in, in our head to say okay there, there's a cash cow over there we, we we don't want to do it like a terrible job. If we're going to do something, we, th we think we should do a good job with it. But it was still approached from, a, I guess, a, a, a non-authentic, our game is better. And we're doing it because we kind of have to, because that's what they expected at that, that time. And, you know, money's fairly attractive. But also, uh, you know, we want to show people how much better we are than D20, D&D. &D. Okay, and here's the you know, D&D. I grew up with that. I mean, I love D&D. &D. Uh, but from a system point of view, it's like, ha, 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 my game's better. Let, let us show you how much better it is by integrating these two and, and effectively shoehorning our point-based power game onto the minimal amount of D20 stuff that we can get away with and call it a D20 game. And then we're going to show you how brilliant we are. And by doing this, look, look, at, look at this now. And ultimately, it was a failure because, I mean, right at that time, Mutants and Masterminds, which we weren't trying to compete with them or anything like that. It's just that they had the idea of doing the D20 right. You know, at that point, that was viewed as if you're going to go outside fantasy with D20, Mutants and Masterminds, how you do it. Mm -hmm. And in, in comparison, our, you know, we, we greatly failed to what they did. Now, I think that some of the advantages that our core system had is still kind of better than some aspects in terms of um, dice and probabilities and power base and and all these things that well i think silver age sentinels d20 there was a reason why people liked it not everyone did i mean we got torn apart with it but the same thing with anime d20 when i think i mentioned back in an earlier one when we talked uh, whenever we're going to do best on fourth edition i kind of put some feelers out to the internet and say hey what's your favorite version of Bessem? And yeah, Bessem Second Edition undoubtedly was number one, but a close second was actually Bessem B20. The, the version that everyone says everyone hates and was a failed product was actually the second most popular version of Bessem. People really liked it. And people, even now in the Absolute Power Kickstarter campaign that we're running currently, some people are saying, hey, I'm a big SAS D20 fan. Are you going to do a D20 version of Absolute Power? Uh, be because for some people it resonated, even if, in my opinion, I think we we fell short from a uh, an artistic game design creation aspect. I think 
SASD20 didn't really make it. Now, what did we do is we brought a kick-ass world into D20 uh, with Silver Age Sentinels D20. We also brought in some interesting game mechanic elements that I think that's what resonated with some people. But I just don't think we did it justice because we weren't... And when I say we, I mean, because I always speak company we, uh, ultimately that was from a game design. Of, I was the system guy. I had Jesse and Lush and Jeff working on more the... Uh, the background and the campaign, but I was kind of the system guy. I wasn't approaching it from from the right position. I was approaching it from an arrogance, from a, um, a very selfish way of doing it, I think. And because of that, I just don't think it. Pr I produced the work that I should have done. And looking now at Anime 5e, I'm like, yeah, that's the type of game that I should have done. And I didn't. Uh, and so it is what it is. Uh, and it's part of the the history. But I think we we did it because it was kind of expected that if you need to survive in the industry and you're a company that's, you know, has some struggles and, you know, Guardians of Order had some financial struggles and that was one of the ways we thought could turn things around and it didn't quite work. Mm -hmm. Now, with that, in, with that in mind, what, pro what prompted the chain, the name change from Silver Age Sentinels to Absolute Power? Because the way that it's described on the Kickstarter page, it gives the, it gives the vibe that this is, a that this is a narrative sequel of sorts yeah well it's not even just like it is set in the same campaign world it is just 20 years later so when sas came out it came out in 2002 but it kind of the campaign world started everything was up to january 1st 2021 that was kind of the starting of the game and now absolute power is january 1st 2021 so i might have said 2021 i meant 2001 so absolute power 2021 silver age sentinels 2001 so it's actually a 20 year later campaign and so it's the everything that happened in sas happened in absolute power so while it is a narrative sequel it's actually a direct sequel um but the the reason why the change came around is when when we came out with the Silver Age Sentinels. I mean, there was a reason we chose that name. Silver Age Sentinels was, we weren't running, it wasn't a Silver Age game. And we always made that clear. We called it Silver Age Sentinels, but right in the in the, the description of the book on the inside, this was not Silver Age. It took to the ideals of the Silver Age about heroism. We didn't want a dark and gothy type game. We didn't want something that was like jaded and, and you know, the world of darkness was obviously fairly big back then. And we're like, we don't want the world of darkness in a superhero game. We want people to be heroes. I mean, my favorite hero, um, Superman, it, it's like... <laughs> the Boy Scout, right? Like the, the the paragon of goodness. And to me, that is what we wanted to to uh, strive to. And other people in the company agreed that all the comp fans was like, yeah, we want to be hero heroes. And so that's where the name came from. But 20 years later, if we look at, at the landscape of what people now know from what has happened in the comic industry and what has happened with uh, a sort, of course, the movies and, you know, how the streaming shows, they've all changed the, 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 perspective on what's happening in comics mm -hmm. 20 years ago comics were showing different things yeah you got your your edginess from image comics and all that with you know mcfarland and, and yeah you, you do have the wildcats and the authority which i actually published the game on the authority so it's not as if that this kind of modern take is is something that just came up you know last year it has been around for a while but it's just so integrated with what the the, the the mind frame of comics are but then more importantly is the world 20 years ago versus the world now like our world the real world it it completely changed the landscape as well i mean what's happening uh with the rise of i don't even say authoritarianism with uh with right-wing mentalities with with you know in canada here we have a, a trucker blockade up in up in our nation's capital uh down in the states you had a you know a storming of the capital in 2021 and and so what's happening in the world right now we we couldn't reasonably do a game that was set in our real world that was the same as Silver Age Sentinels 20 years later because the world isn't the same. If you have characters like Cruz Raider was our big former Nazi villain type of thing. He's not a Nazi anymore. We kind of gave up that Aryan ideals, but like he's the big authoritarian figure. And he's looking around and saying, 
did, do I even have a place anymore? Like there are so many people that are so many world leaders are adopting my stances, uh, you know, and I'm like the big bad type of thing. Like that's, that's the type of mentality we're going with. And then there's also, uh, you know, from 9-11, what ended up happening with that and the amount of reach for security that it was very much a, well, we're going to kind of impinge on your rights a little bit because we can keep you safer that way. You know, so we're going to have you take off your shoes when you go into an airplane and, you know, what's happening with vaccines right now. I mean, not that I disagree with any of it, but it's always the, the, that reaching for a little more power because I can keep you safe. Like what governments are doing right now, superheroes would have that exact same problem and wonder like if if the sentinel our main mix of kind of superman and captain america put together if he could just have that little more power then and a little more authority to do stuff he can keep you safer and it's that constant striving and we weren't looking at absolute power and trying to glorify absolute power you know of course the quote comes from power corrupts and absolute power Corrupts absolutely. It, it it comes from derives from that. It's not that we're glorifying the absolute power. It's the trying to resist the lure of the absolute power. These people who have superpowers and and metahuman abilities, if they they could easily reach for more, and it's that fighting against it. So the good guys have to fight against it, and then the bad guys, of course, they want to revel in it. And then you have the neutrals in between. So when I was going to when we licensed Bassum. Uh, and Silver Age Sentinels from White Wolf, now Paradox, when we licensed it for them, my intention was Silver Age Sentinel 2nd Edition. That was always the intention. Until I started thinking about what that would actually mean doing a game 20 years in the future with superheroes living in today's current administrations in the US and Canada and Russia and North Korea uh, and China and all that. What would superheroes be like now? And Silver Age Sentinels just couldn't work as a title. So absolute power you know talking with uh, robin the um uh, the, the person who kind of did most of the writing for it i did the game stuff robin did the the care the characterization and i i was the one that thought absolute power just kind of worked we hinted a little bit about in previously with guardians of order after sas came out and we've done some expansions over the next couple of years we had talked about well what's how is it going to evolve into what what's the next step and absolute power is kind of banting about then but it just made so much sense 20 years later that yeah it's the perfect title for what we are trying to do mm -hmm. now with that with that in mind given give, given that given that obviously obviously absolute power is going to be reflecting um, some of the changes that Tristat has gone through, through with think with things like Besom Fourth Edition and the um, Besom Mini Trilogy that we've previously discussed. What were what were some of the things in the in the old SAS that you that you felt didn't haven't qu haven't quite uh, meshed mechanically and want and wanted to adjust with Absolute Power? Yeah, and so that was whenever we looked at the evolution of where TriStat was. And again, I was the kind of the main driving force. So, you know, I did for Bessem First Edition TriStat, which is very, very light and hand wavy. And then I brought on David Pulver to kind of mechanicize, uh, get, get more mechanical for Second Edition. And I thought that worked. And then it transitioned into SAS, which was much more crunchy and lots of different comprehensive options. And it was a much, much bigger comprehensive production. Um, the next version was Bessem Third Edition, and we looked at SAS at that point. It's like, uh, yeah, okay, I think I think we can keep some of these aspects, but I think we've made some mistakes, and we made it too crunchy. Uh, and while remember I talked about all those Bessem fans say, oh, we we use Bessem for superheroes. Well, some of them would say, uh, yeah, even though you came out Silver Age Sentinels, we're still using Bessem for superheroes because your game is too complex. <laughs> And that was one of the things we liked about Bassem for superheroes. So Silver Age Sentinels didn't quite work for them. And so when we're when I was working on the design of Bassem Fourth Edition, coming up with some of the ideas of how we handled that level of flexibility is still baked in, but it it got rid of the 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 minutia and the the crunchiness of it, and brought it in a way where mathematically, I mean, I don't want to go into to the kind of the theory of some of the math behind it, but it just the numbers worked so much better in Bessem 4th edition. And I knew whenever I was doing Bessem 4th edition that I just wasn't designing Bessem. I was designing the new TriStat system on which 
absolute power would be based. Because once you come up with what I think is in many ways like the right version of TriStat, after all the iterations, uh, this this is like, yeah, this is where it needs to be mathematically. And it works in a game design. It works in a game play. This is the right version. Absolute power just cranks it up to 11. I mean, they're, they're superheroes, right? So you just turn up the power scale, but all of the elements you created remain the same. You just increase the power. And so it wasn't so much a what are we changing from absolute power that was in SAS. I had already made those changes doing the Bessem third and then going into Bessem fourth edition. I already knew that TriStat had to adapt into a system that was still flexible and comprehensive, but but got the elegance was missing in SAS. The, the comprehension was there, the flexibility was there, but elegance was not part of SAS as much as I thought it was at the time. Now looking back, I can look and see what I did, I'm doing now. It's like, oh yeah, that's significantly more elegant than what it was currently there. Uh, and smoothness in game design is far better than complexity, mm -hmm. in my opinion. Which I, I, can't, I can't disagree with because, well, Phoenix Command has been my whipping boy for years, and so ha and so has everything from Palladium. <laughs> um, <laughs> I mean, like with I've mentioned this in the past, but I love rifts, but I'm not run I'm not running rifts under Palladium rules unless I'm paid. <laughs> well, I, I know that. I mean, and, there's definitely some gamers that like their crunch, right? Like we we know them. I mean, I know them. They they yeah. will they just love the crunchiness of the rules. It's this why hero system was so popular and GURPS yeah. is so popular. Um, I don't prescribe from that. I come from the opposite. Like, while I started on D&D, &D, my, my love that's always close to my heart is Amber Diceless. I mean, when I got introduced to that, my world opened up on what role-playing should be about. Should be, in, in my opinion. I mean, it's not for everyone, but that was the, the total minimalistic narration was, yeah, I want that. But if you still want detailed and, com and comprehensive power sets, what you have to do, and then that's what, something I strive for is creating something that could handle anything in the creation but then fades into the background whenever the story comes in and that's what i always have strived for and i think i've i've hit it really really well with the new version of tristat in besom and yeah. absolute power now i think for a lot of, i think for a lot of people um besom fourth is get is their introduction to um tristat right now and for the for those people, what would be some of the things that they might that they might have that they might have to adjust to when it comes to absolute power, or is the transition between the two um, significantly smoother compared to SAS? Oh yeah, like Bessem Second Edition to SAS was a was a big jump. That was a very very different iteration where Bessem Fourth Edition and Absolute Power a hundred percent compatible system. Like they are the same system. There's it just one just instead of stats typically going to twelve you can have now stats going to twenty four so if you want a, an eighteen body well okay you couldn't reasonably do that in Bessem you could do it because it's just a number but we didn't kind of support that in the base but it, you can take any content from Bessem and use it in absolute power and vice versa. Obviously the power scales are typically different. Best some characters, most anime characters are gonna be sitting in the say 100 to 150 points where in absolute power, you'll have some of your 300 point characters. Like it's it's a massive scale jump on some levels, but there's also absolute power characters that are at the 100, 125, 150 that would fit into a, you know, a My Hero Academia style anime uh, universe, no problem. And, and of course, bring up My Hero, uh, there's obviously some people in that particular anime who have power level scales that's well into absolute power range and well beyond what's in Bessem. I mean, even, of course, you know, ignoring stuff like Dragon Ball, which if you're trying to get those power scales, yeah, that's probably closer to my superhero game than it is my anime game in terms of where it's, uh, where it's going. Yeah, unless you, unless you want to use something as ridiculous as the Immortals Handbook from 3rd thir from Edition, which, um, for, any, for anybody curious... Don't. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, if you're absolutely curious, I can show you how deep that rabbit hole goes, but you're not going to be the same afterwards. Um. Yeah. So, you're, especially your question was, you know, the the Bessem players, how are how are they going to be able to adapt to absolute power? And there, there's no adaptation needed. It's literally just an increase in power scale, but the systems are fully compatible. There is now only one core central aspect of TriStat between those two games. There's other variations in these TriStat mini games that I'm doing, which are more almost like 
art projects like the 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 rep art uh, uh, you know in the in the corner of a, of a small city on a yeah. in a the, tiny building that's what that those books are but these two games are two flagships are fully compatible yeah um when i first found out incidentally when i first found out about the tristat mini project the analogy the analogy that i ended up using is this is what total war sagas was trying to do it, oh, oh um, yeah, fair enough the for what it's worth, the Total War Saga's idea, the the intent was to do more, do smaller scale, more experimental takes on the Total War formula. However, the, however, um, the one, the two, the two sagas games that have that have come out haven't re haven't really done that as much, or the experiment has has um not exactly worked. Um, I think to Britannia and how and how you and how it was a little bit on the a little bit on the tedious end with the war weariness almost punishing you for doing good um and then they tried to turn fall of the samurai into a sagas game which didn't work oh um, but with that but it's but the mini games i look at it as a, as a way to do experimental ideas within the tristat framework that you could that you couldn't get away with in the in the bigger titles yeah they, they were i mean those mini games were i kind of look at them as they are the intention is to take tristat and turn it into a philosophy rather than a, a game yeah. so the philosophy of tristat and what you can do with it so maybe these numbers aren't the same maybe they don't all quite work but if you look at tristat as tristat is a philosophy of game design and therefore we can make it very specific when you're playing pixies which is you know it does oh, it's the exact opposite of absolute power and besom which is you can handle everything well pixies is you have one type of character everyone are small pixies and you live in a house and th there's so little flexibility there now of course within that range you have some flexibility uh you know the, the type of pixie are you a fast pixie are you a strong pixie magical pixie but you know it's it's that it's so narrow and so the philosophy of tristat i thought carried through with these variations um almost like you can kind of say you know, if you want to bring it up you know, from a superhero point of view tristat mini games are the what if uh marvel uh you know special on on disney these are the what ifs you change tristat into a different philosophy for pixies or worms a demonicity but absolute power takes everything great about besom but then adds on that campaign world that was that was really missing from the the universal anime game and that's why i just love absolute power i'm so proud of how how this product turned yeah. out now given given the power scaling i'd like I'd like to play a bit of lightning round. I'm going. I'm going to go through the power levels from minor to godlike, and I'd like you to to na to see to see if you can name a character, whether it be in whether it be in superheroes or or an or an anime that would be a good approximation of that um, tier. Sure. Yeah, yeah. So we start off with minor power, which is um, fifty to seventy four character points. Yeah, and and with when you get into those, these are more your um like your supporting characters that typically aren't thought of as being main characters think think detective gordon right mm -hmm. like detective gordon you can play a game where detective gordon is a main character i mean the, the gotham tv series was pretty awesome but they're not in the same scale of most superheroes and they they have good abilities and skills or whatever it is that they do but when you're dealing in the kind of under 100 points you're really dealing with more normal humans that might have one or two little quirky things but in the end they would what i would consider in most comic book worlds these are your supporting characters yeah. other than when they decide to go off and do these you know very focused kind of ways i probably would have gone with renee montoya but uh, but that's just me <laughs> <laughs> um moderate moderate so what kind of point range are we talk i just don't have it in front of me so, um, so i don't remember to 99 cp yeah so this is your your almost like your street level uh teen titan type people to think someone who is you're in school you're you're young or you're a novice or maybe you just got your powers and you're not in school but these are the severely underpowered usually incredibly focused like they can do one or two things and, and that's what they they focus on so uh at the 
well, I mean, it's technically it's in the uh, 100 points, but we have a characters that start there. In the core SAS world, or yeah, absolute power world, in when we stat out uh, you know, several dozen characters, no one is under 100 points for for superhero characters like we have npc types like you can have your crime lords and your crime bosses and your 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 street toughs all of those would be the under 100 points uh, but typically you'd, you'd be dealing with your your novices at that point um average which yeah so that's the, the... to one, 100 to 149 sorry yeah and so that so this is where you get into think of like a like a we have Lady of the Lantern is our main character at that one, and uh, she's at a hundred points. But you're dealing with with your um, your more your lower level Robin. Uh, if people are kind of looking in their head on, you know, obviously. Once again, when I, when I bring up superhero characters from established universe, I say Robin. People can have com two completely different views of what he can do because it depends on the comics that they're thinking of. Both but if you think of Robin, <laughs> well, that's well, of course, there's that. Think maybe. Uh, like Netflix Daredevil um, mm -hmm. would probably be in that range. It depends on how heavy you lean into the supernatural or superpowered stuff. Yeah. But you're dealing with like real people that they may have a special ability or two and can do some interesting things. But in the end, they are uh, what I would consider your more street level characters. I mm -hmm. um, wonder if Constantine would fall under that as well. No, I, I think he's actually quite powerful Constantine because when he gets into his he, uh, magic is one of those big you know, like where do you go with magic it, it could be so flexible uh, but he might be a little bit outside that range I think he's actually going to be in the next phase which yeah. is the 150 to 199 yeah that's major right yeah and and I think that's where um, you're, you're non I have calculated out everyone's death and how to defeat everyone in advance that that Batman, like he's way above it. But the, the what what a lot of people would think, I guess maybe a lot of non comic book fans would think of Batman. I think that's where he'd fit in that category. So our Caliburn, which is our Daredevil slash Batman slash, you know, because he's so old, he can bit a bit of Jack Lalane in going in on there. Um, but he'd be at one fifty points. So when you're at the the one fifty, one seventy five, two hundred, is you can. You're either you know, could be a normal human at at a peak perfection. So you're looking at your your eleven, twelves, your your best in the world, your best, the world's best athletes or the world best brains, not the super world's best brains, but you know peak perfection of humanity um, with items or gear or some low levels of superpowers. That's the one fifty to kind of one ninety nine range. Mm -hmm. So. Next would be extreme power, which is two hundred to two forty nine. Yeah, and that covers a lot. Uh, I'd say is many ways almost like the biggest range of most Marvel characters are going to be in that range. Actually, probably you can extend Marvel because there's a lot of lower level. Maybe the one fifty to two fifty. Like if you're going to go to a wider range, but it is a lot of characters are going to be in that two to two fifty. Like that's. That's going to be almost everyone, with the exceptions of the the super powerhouses. So in our game, we have multiple characters there. Whether it's uh, Magistrate, which is you know Canada's number one superhero, uh, is at two hundred. You also have uh, Officer. Well, it used to be Officer Prometheus. Now he's Citizen Prometheus. He's kind of our flame guy. Used to be a cop. Uh, he's at two hundred. And so these are at the lower end of the uh, end of frames. Um, you get into if you're thinking of kind of Avengers. Like DC, um, most of the more powerful ones are going to be in that range. Yep. And next would be the legendary tier, which is 250 to 299. Yeah, and in this range, you're dealing with all the other ones other than kind of like like the, the the super super people. So Superman is not in that level. So the, the, you know, the Sentinel is is above that. But when you're dealing with your 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 juggernaut, uh, I don't mean capital J juggernaut, uh, your small J, J juggernaut uh, people, like the, the super strong, super powerful, really good magicians. These people are often going to be up to the 300 points. Above yeah. 300, you're getting into, uh, and that's, of course, the next one is is 300 and, yeah, and that's say, above. Like yeah, and that's, you really get like Superman. 
Um, maybe even uh, depending on how you're going to view Doctor Strange, because you know magic is again it's one of those. What can you do? Um, so your your Doctor Doom, people that have massive resources, uh, they don't always have to be massively powerful. Like a, like sibling, it's like a like a Sentinel, which is super strong, super fast. Like you don't have to have that if you also if you have at your at your command like armies and armies of people and you rule nations and and you are you know a hundred billion dollars like when you start getting into non-super powered resources those are still adding on to your advantages and so in our game we only have uh, in of the the several that we stat out the, the several dozen there's only three or four that are above 300 because it is such a rare power range to our be there so that's where our the analogs of the, the the Doctor Doom type with the Superman type are going to be in that range, as well as your massively powerful uh, wizards uh, and your massive, uh, you know, interdimensional main villains. Like think of your Thanos type are going to be in that above three hundred. And these are the ones that that change the world in terms of what they can do. Um, I am curious, given. The way you describe it, the three hundred, the three hundred plus tier could be described could be described as cosmic tier. Um, given that, where would you put, say, Silver Surfer, in that in that? Yeah, and once again, when you're going to bring into you know how powerful they are, uh, yeah, when you start getting into well, I can literally eat planets, mm -hmm. like <laughs> like oh okay, well you're still a you're we're having one category which is three hundred and above mm -hmm. because when you get into changing almost rules of physics when you're that level of powerful silver surfer galactus um you know the um uh, the some of the people in the eternals like the the what they're called the watchers no not the watchers the uh the, whatever they are i mean that like the, the, the Just world shaking the people uh, any, of the, uh, yeah. any of the big stuff that jack kirby was involved with we can just use that as a catch-all yeah, I mean, it, when, when you're dealing with that kind of almost like when I say God level, godlike, I, I don't, you know, at, at a certain point you stop being godlike and you start being God uh, or a God, small g. Uh, those people may be 400 points, but because our system isn't like it's not linear. If someone is a, and that's what's really what I really like about uh, uh, a very aggressive point based system is a character who's 100 points is not half as powerful as someone's at 200 points. Because if you if you try to have linear, um, you are going to have literally up to ten thousand points because you can't do linear strength, super strength. Like it, it just doesn't work. Uh, you can't have linear magic because again, it just can't work. And so, because of the nature of the almost exponential, but not necessarily times ten, you know, exponent to the two or the ten, but because you're dealing with an exponential system, the if people say, oh, I want to create. Galactus, I want to create a Silver Surfer. Then rather than 350, you might be four, 455, but you're not going to be 10,000. Like we, we just, that's just not how a, a non linear system works. Yeah. So that everything is possible within a, a reasonable confines of, of the system. Mm -hmm. Now, one thing I saw in a, in a small form on the Kickstarter page that, well, that wasn't in the PDF preview itself. That I was curious about is the quick play templates. Now, with a lot of these, is it bit is it is it variations on a certain on a, thir on a certain theme, a certain package? So yeah, so the when we did uh, Bessem Fourth Edition, mm -hmm. the the template aspects we had like twenty five different races, twenty five different classes, which are almost like occupations or callings. And so having this this massive amount of templates was a really great way to get started. If you kind of don't know what to do, you're like, oh, I'm gonna I'm gonna pick, I'm gonna be a ninja and I'm gonna be a cat girl. So cat girl ninja, boom, you put the two templates together and then maybe throw some on extra points and you can start playing right away. It's as you said, when in a point based system, if you just throw people out there, they can spend forever trying to determine what to do. And we I, I thought we learned whenever I was working on the best and fourth edition that I was like, yeah, we need to do this for absolute power as well. Because everyone knows speedsters or champions or uh, your powerhouses, your elementers. Like these are things that uh, you're, 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 that people know, right? And it, when you say speedster, well, there's kind of a low level speedster, mid level, high level. And so what we decided to do with these templates was to show people 
you can get started right away by just picking a, a level and picking a, an archetype. So if the archetype I want to be, I want to be a a uh, like kind of a, a costumed warrior. Think of your your Batman, Daredevil, whatnot. You would pick that archetype template. But then, do you want to be low, medium, or high range? And so, with the dozen that we have, and then or fifteen that we have, then from that fifteen, now you can choose which of the three levels. The one exception we break that with, uh, and that is from uh, what would you call an, an animalist? Think of them as like you know, animal powers or shapeshifters. And the reason why we broke it with that is because there's aquatic-based animal-type characters. There's uh, sea, air, sea, land. And so rather than splitting up in just general power levels, we broke it up by the type of the air. So at the 40-point archetype for the animalist is land, 50 is sea, 60 is air. Mm -hmm. Because, of course, the air characters typically have things that you know, like flying is a more expensive power than swimming, as an example. Uh, and so that's where we came up with those. And that was something that we think is going to be instrumental for people to see, first of all, how we build a an acrobat. You know, what are some of the things? I want to I want to be an acrobatic type character. Okay, well, what are the kind of things I, I could use? So you could either use the templates as they are, these power templates, or instead you can see how we as the game designers recommend that you consider some of these aspects and then you can build your own character the way you want to. So they're optional, just like they were in Bessem, where if someone wants to be a dwarf, they can take the dwarf template or they can, they can just build their own dwarf, of course. You don't have to choose our version of a dwarf. But this was something that was intended to make the game more approachable and easier because it can be pretty daunting when you don't have hardly any guidance. Mm -hmm. And like, which is, again, is something that I appreciate because, well, sometimes you need, you need characters to be put together um, quickly. And there's also the whole thing of, I can, I, I bring this up a lot and the, and I'm going to keep bringing it up and until it stops applying, but analysis paralysis is, oh yeah, it 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 is, it is already an issue with a lot of with a with a lot of role playing games, and whenever you get into generalist or supers games, the problem the problem goes up by ten. Yeah, yeah, they do, <laughs> uh, and and you'll get it. You'll get some games like uh, like say Mutants and Masterminds, where they have because they're more class based systems, so it's not not quite D and D class, but more like that. Again, they're going to have your archetype as well, yeah. so you can have your your powerhouse or or whatever the the ones you choose from there, and it just gives you something to build from. Uh, these are optional, but they're useful, and they're useful for GMs and players. Yeah, something something else I'm. I'm curious about when it comes to those templates is do you have um say suppose suppose that somebody wanted to use one of these templates but wanted to use it at a at a significantly higher that the the campaign is at a significantly higher tier so just just for just for the proverbial shits and giggles um suppose that suppose that that um they wanted to use one of the templates but the, but you, but the campaign is starting off at extreme power instead of average, right. for instance. Um, is there? Do you get? Do you plan on anything in in the books to adjust to adjust for a higher a higher character point set up with those with those templates? Well, and that's where from a point based system, uh, if you were given, uh, you know, in a game, your GM says, "Okay, build two hundred point characters." You're like, oh, okay, I want to be a, a, a Howd speedster. Howd is our alien reptilian race. So you want to be a Howd speedster. So you can say, okay, I'm going to take the, the highest level speedster I can get. That's at 60 character points. It's a third degree speedster. So 60 character points for my speedster. And then I'm going to look up, well, I want to be a Howd. And that's 70 points to be a Howd. And here's all the things that a Howd gives. Well, I, that's 130 points goes towards those. But if I'm a 200 point character, I still have 70 points to spend left over. And so from those 70 points, instead of saying, well, I see the, the speedster, my template for the third degree is level six. He goes 30,000 kilometers an hour. What? Well, I want to go a million kilometers an hour. 
Well, okay, just buy it up several levels. So instead of level six, you have these extra points. You can make it a level seven, eight, nine, ten. Like match the vision that you have for your character by adding the points. Or similarly, if you're like, well, I like all the elements of this this package that you have here for, uh, let's just say, a weaponeer. I think, like, oh, I like the weaponeer template, but uh, my guy uh, he can't throw things. Uh, because uh, you know he has uh, he's made of wood and he has stumps and he can't throw anything. So having a ranged attack doesn't make any sense because he can't throw anything uh, because he has the defect that he doesn't have any hands. So because of that, you could just remove that from your template. So these are these are baselines. But if you want to be more powerful, you just you just augment them. And if you want to be less powerful, you just remove them. And that's the beauty of of these that you don't get that like D and D. Someone's like, oh, I want to be a I'm going to start with the fighter, but my fighter has this thing that he does like oh I, I can cast a spell as a fighter like i uh, my in my background i learned that i can put people to sleep through the i'm not a trance but i'm a fighter and they're gonna go no you can't there's no way to do that like you just that's not on the rules uh which is why we did anime 5e to add these options to a more rigid system to say now you can be a fighter in DD who also happens to can cast a sleep spell uh because without multi-classing right because that's just the flexibility same thing with with absolute power these things are your baselines but then you could adjust it with uh, fewer or more points as you go yeah and that that and well, let's face it, multi multi classing in D and D, regardless of edition, is a minefield at best. <laughs> well, well, that's true. <laughs> um, it's good. just saying. There's more. There's more traps in that mousetrap board game I played as a kid. <laughs> oh, now with that with that in, with that in mind, I know that the I know that absolute power is being split into two books: system and essentials. What are you shooting for for the page count for each? So the books are done. They're both 336 pages. Uh, the reason why they had to split in the two books is because originally there's just going to be one. Like, of course, almost every role-playing game is published in a single book. And that was always our intention. But we wanted to have the system and we wanted to have the campaign world. And we still wanted to have really good jamming and player advice, you know, and guidance for that. And then when we looked at, you know, oh, wow, this, this is a half million words. There's no way I want to publish a 700-page core book. I mean, not only would the book be like the $120, so very expensive for a single book, but also there are people that are, are in the publishing industry. You do get an integrity of the, the actual physical volume of an integrity of something. The bigger you get, the harder it is to have a quality book that's going to stand up to lots of use. So interesting like the original silvery sentinels uh, game was 336 pages i mean it was not intentional for us to have two books of exactly 336 the, in publishing you have to publish you know it's best to publish in 16 page signatures they're called so groups of 16 pages and it just happened to turn out that both books when we when we split them up in what what made sense from a system book and an essentials book that they both turned out with the exact same page count we we didn't have to have it that way but it worked out that they're both 336 which is basically double the size of Silver Age Sentinels. In fact, it's even bigger than double the size because the, the word count per page is higher in absolute power. So that's why we're up to the almost half million words. Uh, it's it's a massive undertaking to do this. We worked on it for two years and it, it's a sweet, sweet product, but it is expensive because if you want the whole thing, it's not a single volume. You're really buying two core books. Mm -hmm. Think of it like when people are like, oh my gosh, it's so expensive. It's like, okay, it is. I'm not going to doubt that. But, if you want to play D and D, you buy the player's handbook, the DMG, and the monster manual, mm -hmm. and that's three books, <laughs> and that's like one hundred and fifty dollars if they're fifty retail each. Mm -hmm. So it's not unprecedented the idea of having multiple core volumes rather than an expansion, because the campaign world is not an expansion of, of absolute power; it is a core book. And it's fun. It's funny you bring up the three books with D with D and D with D and D because I remember complaining with Five E that. That they staggered the the with the releases of each book. Yeah, book, which um, that was interesting. Not, it's not something and I would have done personally. Um. <laughs> there, there are logistical reasons why I think they did that, and from a business point of view, I understand the logistical reasons. Uh, but yeah, I mean, when when he's like, "Oh, great, I got the player's handbook." Um, well, I can't run the game because I don't have the Dungeon Master's Guide. Uh, <laughs> but uh, in the end. Yeah. <laughs> It's Wizards of the Coast. They, they, they 
they're 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 doing very well at D&D. So, you know, it had a, a built in fan base, it had a history. Absolute power, while there are our Silver Age Sentinels players, at the same time, it, it doesn't have anywhere near the scope that D D is. So when we released them, uh this had to be released as a joint package. And we had the opportunity of just releasing two core books, but you know, if you're releasing two core books, wouldn't it be great if we can put them together into a nice slipcase as well and, and have them as a single product, even though it's two books, which is why we have that other option in the Kickstarter as well. And that'll be not something that's just a Kickstarter exclusive. It's it's a new way of presenting the books is in this package. Yeah. Now, one other thing I want to bring up when it comes to compatibility is some of the stuff that was introduced in Besom Extras. And... Given given the up given the up scale, would would some of the mechanics that were introduced in Besom Extras be compatible with Absolute Power? Yeah, almost everything in Besom Extras, uh, from a mechanic point of view, is in Absolute Power, but not not always as a base rule. So one of the advantages of Extras, and what it was always kind of the vision for Extras, was here's some really good things that we think you may like for your game. But they may not be things you want to integrate in because it does either add complexity or maybe it doesn't fit your style of gaming. So when we looked at Absolute Power, there are certain things that I think are more common or maybe more essential in a superhero role-playing game than than in an anime role-playing game. And so there were some elements that were in extras that were considered optional that are part of the core base in Absolute Power. But there's other aspects, just to think of like mass combat or sanity rules. Well, sanity certainly has its place if you're running a horror-based supernatural uh, superhero game. And so we wanted those sanity rules in, but they're in a chapter that's an optional rules chapter. Mm-hmm. It's like almost like there's a chapter that's best some extras inside absolute power. There are other aspects, as I mentioned, that are part of the core game now, but there's some aspects that are integrated. So if we looked at, let's just say uh, some of the, and the enhancements and limiters that were in best and extras for some of the the base attributes they would most likely be part of the core attribute power because i think they're they're good ideas and so if people are saying, well, I'm into Bessem and you know I know extras and I have Bessem, what is in absolute power? In many ways I say Bessem fourth edition plus Bessem extras plus ratcheted up to level 11, you know, turn it up, that's what absolute power is. It's kind of a combination of, of those put together, and that's what the system is. Yeah. Now, with that in mind, what are you shooting for as far as a release window for the project? Yeah, so we're, one of the things that we we think we've, we've learned a lot from during the pandemic, we had a few Kickstarters go, and then we ran into some production problems and shipping issues. And we've learned a bit uh, about that now in terms of timing and, and lining things up in advance. And we're working with some better partners now than we had, say, a year ago, and we ended up having some of, some of the issues. And so if everything goes well, and this isn't even being overly optimistic based on the dealings we have with our printers. This is provided there's no no wrenches thrown in that we can't predict. Mm-hmm. Uh, this, we're looking at a, a summer release, probably July, August fulfillment for the Kickstarter, if everything goes well, uh, because we have a philosophy that I really like not running a Kickstarter until the products are done. And it doesn't have to be 100% done, but we're not talking 50% done either. We're like 95, 96%. Maybe there's a couple final things that I need to go, which is when we run Kickstarters, we don't have stretch goals the way some companies are like, oh, we'll add 32 extra pages to the core book. I'm like, what? What? How are you going to do that? Isn't your book done? Like, like, we don't do a Kickstarter until our products are finished. So the advantage of our method is when the Kickstarter ends and then, you know, a couple of weeks go by to collect the funds and, you know, process anyone's credit card who got rejected or whatnot. And then people fill out their survey, but within a month of the Kickstarter ended, everyone receives all their digital products, like everything they get. They'll get the core games. They'll get the, the GM screen and the player, the, the character folio. They'll get their, their PDF versions of all of it in March. And the campaign ends on the 3rd of March, but by the end of March, they're going to have all their PDFs because everything's done. It's just the physical production is going to take a little bit longer than that. And that's something that's really important when we run Kickstarters. Of course, you'd say, well, I would never know that given how long it's taken to fulfill some of them on the, you know, the, the last couple we've had. It's like, I agree. We had some big issues with Anime 5e, Bessem, 
and of course, uh, got some extras. And a lot of those I can chalk them up to uh, pandemic happened and we didn't know there's going to be a global supply chain issue and the entire freight system of the world would shut down. Didn't really know that was going to happen. Uh, but now that we do know that's happening, we've adjusted for it. And I think we're going to be uh, much better at adhering to the timelines that we think are realistic. And I will, I will certainly be looking forward to seeing um, how how it how it turns out when the t when the time comes. But with all that said, I would like to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness at play here. Yeah, my my pleasure, and I really appreciate the opportunity once again to come on and uh, talk to your listeners about some of the stuff that I'm passionate about and that what our company is doing. And anytime you see fit to return to the temple, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. And of, co and of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then... On behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody! <laughs>